Vienna. Um, as you saw from the flyer, uh, he's a traditional priest. He was the past secretary to Cardinal Alphonse uh, Stickler, who was the prefect of the Vatican Library. Father has been in the United States for the last four weeks, uh, giving talks and meeting with Catholics in Wyoming, Wisconsin, etc. And he'll be spending a couple of days here. If you need to talk to Father, brochure has my number. Father's staying in my home. Give me a call. Um, he is an expert in canon law, church history, papal pronouncements, and councils. And that leads us right up to the title of the talk, Papal Infallibility versus Papal Fallibility and the Limit of Papal Authority. With that, I give you Father Gregory Tessa. Thank you. In the name of the Patrice, it feels good to thank you. I'm going to ask you 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 to ask I've been told that today, uh, November 12th, the Ukrainian church celebrates St. Josephat. I have something to add to that. We in the Latin church have to celebrate it on November 14th, which is Sunday this year. So usually in the Latin church this year, St. Josephat will not be celebrated. It might please some people here. To, when I tell them that my travel altar's patron and my travel altar's relic is St. Josephat, so I will celebrate St. Josephat this Sunday and commemorate the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, which is celebrated otherwise in the traditional churches. I have chosen the topic today to be fallibilitas pape, the fallibility of the Pope, for several reasons. First of all, in the 1930s, basically, the universal opinion came up that the Pope cannot err. Whatever the Pope says is infallible. People told me that when they still attended school, the sisters would tell them, obedience, 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 and the infallibility of the Pope. Whatever the Pope says, whatever the Pope writes is infallible. I will give you tonight definite proof that that is not the case. I will show you what the, pope, what the popes did in history. I will hold my lecture according to chronological principles, so do not expect me to talk about the popes who were heretics, the popes who were in error, the popes who were undisciplined, and the popes who were criminals. Let me uh, just mention the popes in the order of chronology, and whatever comes will come to you as a surprise as it came to me in many cases when I started to prepare this lecture. One other reason why I'm holding this lecture is because I'm always getting uh, kind of confused opinions about uh, the recent popes, uh, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 1st, and John Paul the 2nd. Or people try to tell me that Paul VI was kidnapped and replaced by a double, uh, and uh, John Paul II is under drugs and therefore not responsible for his actions. Well, John Paul II, poor man, he is under drugs because he was shot in 1981. But uh, he was not exchanged. He also was not invalidly elected. Some people tell me in 1958 it was actually Cardinal Siri who was elected, but John XXIII came out. You will see after this lecture that's all nonsense. Then some people tell me that we have uh, no Pope since Assisi, 1996, 86, thank you. That we have no Pope since 1986 because John Paul II sat down with other religions and uh, just simply prayed together with them, uh, which was not a very nice thing to do, but he did it and uh, it certainly make, did make him to cease, po cease to be Pope as we see as we will see from other examples. And some other people tell me we don't have a Pope since 1965 because December 7th, Paul VI signed the uh, Declaration of uh, Religious Liberty. Then some people tell me we don't have a Pope since 1958. 
since John the 23rd was a heretic before he was elected, therefore he couldn't be elected. We will see how uh, untrue that is in the course of the lecture. And then uh, I've actually had a letter from Florida that told me that poor Pope Pius X was an anti-Pope <laughs> because he changed the breviary. Well, as far as anti-popes are concerned, I can tell you the Catholic Church doesn't know an anti-pope unless there is a pope and somebody else claims to be pope. The first pope who was in grave error and had to be corrected publicly was St. Peter. I quote a reliable witness called St. Paul. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. He had to be corrected publicly. He was the first pope, and that was a very ominous start of papal history. The next one we know of, mind you, this is not a complete list. I do not pretend uh, any percentage of what I'm giving you. I don't know if it's 50% or 70, uh, I don't know. Because there's many things that have been lost over the course of the centuries. Now, Pope Liberius was Pope from 352 until 366. When he was in exile, you can look up in histories why he was in exile, we don't have time for that today. In exile, he signed the creed of the semi-Aryan synod in Sirmium in 351, which contradicted directly the dogmatic definition of Nicaea in 357. The semi-Aryans, the Aryans, uh, the Aryans just simply denied uh, Christ being God. The semi-Aryans wanted to uh, have a compromise in order to, uh, to establish a sort of reconciliation, a sort of peace, uh, which I wouldn't call peace, but anyway. Uh, and they said they just changed one letter of a Greek word. The Council of Nicaea had dogmatically defined that Christ is homoousios with the Father, of the same substance. Usia, the substance, homo, the same. Homoousios. The semi-Aryans changed the word to homoousios, which is to similar substance of God. Now, if Christ was of a similar substance with God, he wouldn't be God. Only if he was of the same substance with the Father, he could possibly be God. It is interesting to see that it only needed about uh, three and a half centuries until Christ's prophecy came true when he said, even if one Yoda was changed of my words. Well, here one Yoda was added. To the word homoousios, the Yoda was added and it became homoousios and it caused several centuries of confusion in the entire Catholic Church, so much so that the only one who stayed true with the church was St. Athanasius. Needless to say, Pope Liberius excommunicated St. Athanasius. In order not to take party with any uh, one of the many parties back then, he avoided the homoousion in the creed. That is something that will happen later on again. St. Hilary of Poitiers called Pope Liberius traitor. The next pope to write error was St. Leo I, St. Leo the Great. He was pope from 440 to 461, and in his letter to Bishop Flavian of Constantinople in 449, he wrote, In Christ, 
the, mo the, the nature of the mother was assumed not her fault. That's against the Immaculate Conception. However, be careful, the Immaculate Conception was not defined a dogma back then, so uh, Saint Leo was not a heretic, but it just shows that the Pope can be in error. In Latin it is assumpta est de matre natura non culpa. You know in Mass the mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Assumpta est de matre natura non culpa. That means Our Lady had the culpa. Nope, she didn't. That certainly is strange. It might be, who knows why Saint Leo wrote it, but the fact is he was Pope when he wrote it and it is erroneous. In fact, then it was erroneous, now it would be heresy. The next one to uh, make a big mistake about two theologians was Saint Pelagius, no, he wasn't a saint, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, take that back. Pope Pelagius I, 556 to 561, in 557, in an encyclical, it's not just a letter to the bishop, in an encyclical called Vas Erectionis, you find the following quotation. Mainly the venerable bishops, I pronounce that the Greek way, otherwise the, long, the name will never be found again. Mainly the venerable bishop Theodoretus, he was the bishop of Cyrus, and Ebas, he was the bishop of Edessa, whom I venerate among the Orthodox. That's what, Saint pa that's what Pope Pelagius said. I venerate them among the Orthodox. St. Gregory the Great, about the same bishops, said they are anathema. So Pope Pelagius holds them as orthodox theologians. Pope Gregory the Great holds them as anathema. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 holds them as orthodox bishops, but mark the distinction in the text of the council, not in a canon. While the Council of Constantinople, number two, in Canon 13 and Canon 14, talks about their godless writings. So one Pope says they were Orthodox, one Council says in its text they were Orthodox. Pope Gregory the Great said they were heretics, they have to be held anathema. Held anathema. And uh, the Council of Constantinople number two spoke about their godless writings and condemned them in a canon. You find this canon in Denzinger 436. And Gregory the Great's uh, condemnation is found in 472. In comes Pope Honorius I, who was Pope from 625 until 638. He says, <coughs> We confess the one will of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now if our Lord Jesus Christ had one will, he couldn't have been obedient to the Father. Or he wasn't God. Because obviously if our Lord Jesus Christ is God, then he has the divine will. And if he is man, then he has the human will. So of course the church teaches, and by the time Honorius said that, it was already doctrine of the church, defined doctrine of the church. But Christ had two wills. He had the human will that always submitted to the divine will. Honorius said, we confess the one will of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you realize the formula, we confess? If a pope says, we confess, usually it means the church teaches. So now we are getting closer to a dogma that is not a dogma, but false. We confess the one will of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is in Denzing of 487, for those who like to look it up. And the Third Council of Constantinople condemned Honorius in 681, pronounced the anathema over Honorius, over Pope Honorius. And that's in Denzing of 550 following. Now, do you notice something interesting here? Honorius was condemned as anathema by an ecumenical council. But in the Annuario Pontificio, which is the official yearbook of the Pope in the Vatican, as was, uh, I always enjoy it when Americans say the Pope in the Vatican, well, what else is he? Um, 
This is the official book of the papacy and it has a complete list of all popes ever since St. Peter. Now Honorius is right there in that list, even though he was called anathema by an ecumenical council. We'll find more examples like that. The next one, Saint Nicholas I, also called Nicholas the Great. He was Pope from 850, uh, sorry, 858 until 867. He contradicted defined doctrine. Church doctrine, that was defined several times over. Now, you all know that the only way to baptize validly is to say, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Trinitarian baptism, right? And it doesn't matter which language you say it, unless you say it in, uh, in uh, 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 what is it? Uh, Papua. The Papua dialect will say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the taboo, taboo. <laughs> so that's kind of strange, but you probably would have to baptize in Latin or English in the Papua Islands, but otherwise, it's always clear in whatever language it is, it has to be Trinitarian. Right? Now, Pope Pelagius I defined the Trinitarian baptismal form in 558. Gregory the Great defined it in 601. Gregory II in 726. Pope Zacharias in 748. Pope Stephen II in 754. And then in comes Saint Nicholas I, and in a letter to the Bulgarians says, whether it's Trinitarian or in the name of Christ, that's the same. And he tells the bishops there, if a heretic converts, and he, the heretic was baptized in the name of Christ, he doesn't have to be conditionally rebaptized, or actually, actually, we should say, he doesn't have to be baptized, because he is already baptized. Here we have a Pope who, in a letter to the bishops, contradicts several times over defined church doctrine. That makes him a heretic, doesn't it? The fact is that uh, the church father, St. Ambrose, said, I baptize you in the name of Christ as a valid baptism. Well, fortunately, the church has never attempted to declare the church fathers as infallible. As you can see, they were not. Poor St. Ambrose made a mistake, so what? We all do it. We all make mistakes, and we all make sometimes mistakes in public, so that's what St. Ambrose did. The misunderstanding comes about of a misunderstanding. Of, uh, it's, it, this misunderstanding of St. Ambrose is the result of a misunderstanding of the words of St. Paul. Because St. Paul in, the, in Romans 3.6 and in Galatians 3.27 says, uh, baptized in the name of Christ. But what they forget is St. Paul obviously presumed, and rightly so, because even we remember it, uh, presumed that we would all remember our Lord's last words in St. Matthew. Go into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So St. Paul presumed these words. Now he wrote a lot of letters and I mean he was just abbreviating. And we also know from uh, some comments of the time that St. Nicholas I, how come that the so-called St. Nicholas I uh, would say such a horrible thing? Can you imagine when he says that I baptize thee in the name of Christ is valid, he thus caused many people to die without baptism. You realize the, the effect of that, of that era? He had a lot of people die without baptism. I'm not worried about them because it was the Pope's fault, but some people are worried about them. And uh, the, it was, uh, he must have been a strange character because at one point during his pontificate, he received uh, the Archbishop of Cologne in audience, didn't really explain much to him and excommunicated him. <laughs> Just like that. He wasn't the only one to do things like that, but he was one of the first ones. And the strange thing is that he's called Saint Nicholas I. 
Now, uh, the next one on my list is uh, John VIII. He's somehow innocently on this list because uh, here the real strange fact is about Leo XIII, the same man who canonized uh, St. Joseph and inserted his feast into the Roman calendar, uh, he also canonized St. Methodius. And that is quite, quite strange, quite strange indeed, because when St. Methodius, well, I should say Methodius, when Metho Methodius brought the Slavonic liturgy through Czechoslovakia into Russia, he did so against papal instructions. Several times the popes forbade Methodius to use the vernacular for the liturgy. And he did it, all, he did it anyway. Under the eyes of the pope, he celebrated the Slavonic liturgy in St. Mary Majors. I mean, you talk about obedience. This was not exactly the number one example of obedience. And uh, John VIII finally blessed him doing that, which was a big mistake, because that's how uh, we have now another liturgical language, which should have never happened, because Latin is more logical than the ancient Slavonic, no offense intended, needless to say, but it's a fact. Latin is the most, of, most philosophical of all languages. It's the only language in which you can actually express every single philosophical concept. The result is that uh, the Latin the theology is also, thanks to St. Thomas Aquinas and many others, the most logical, the most uncontradictable. And uh, what I wonder about here is much less Pope John VIII, but uh, Pope Leo XIII. We'll come back to the question of canonizations. And then, now, the first pope on the list of those who slightly misbehaved was Stephen VI, who was pope from 896 to 897. He was not really a friend of his predecessor, Formosus. Formosus was a pope who did indeed not behave very well from in many ways, and I have no intention of explaining in what, in what ways. However, Stephen VI thought that that was such an incredibly miserable pope that he would have to be unpoped, unbishoped, and unclericalized afterwards. He had the dead and rotting away Pope Formosus dug up from his grave, <laughs> dressed him in episcopal vestments, and went through the whole rite of deposition and excommunication by having had his mitre taken off, his crozier taken away, his uh, pontifical vestments taken off, and then he would cut off index and thumb, which used to hold the Eucharist, and then he would throw the cadaver into the Tiber. Fortunately, some people fished it up, and so he got a decent funeral after all. But this was a Pope, Stephen VI. The only thing he really entered history for was this action. <laughs> Now we come to the year 904, where Sergius III became Pope, until 911. He did not govern the church, in no way whatsoever. It was the wife of uh, the uh, Count of Frascati, you know, the, the light Italian white wine Frascati, that was back then Tusculum. And the Counts of Tusculum, were called, uh, the Count of Tusculum at the time was called Theophylactus. So they're called the, uh, the dynasty of the Theophylactians. Theophylactus was married to a certain Theodora, and they had two daughters, Marozia and Theodora. The wife, Theodora, and later on the daughter, Marozia, would control the papacy for several decades. Marozia made a fast career. She became Patrizia, patrician of Rome. She became senatrix, senator. Don't we know that? Uh, and they dictated all the actions of the following popes. Leo VI in 928, Stephen VII in 929 until 931. And finally, uh, Marozia's own son was made pope by her. He was never elected. He was made pope by his mother. 
The Annuario Pontificio counts him among the popes as John XI from 931 until 935. So you see, never elected, put on the papal throne by his own mother, who was a rotten woman, and yet the Annuario Pontificio has no doubt about his valid papacy. Then came John XII, worse than John XI. He was Pope from 955 until 964. He led such an immoral life that the Emperor Otto I bothered to come down from Germany. Now there were no ice trains in those days. And uh, that was a pretty troublesome thing in the year 950 something to come down from Germany. Anyway, the Emperor Otto bothered to come down to Rome and forced John XII to swear an oath to him to do his duty in the papacy. Actually, the oath he swore, we will see later on, it was the oath of incoronation. And uh, John XII had to sign it and hand it to the emperor. The moment the emperor had left Rome, John XII, John XII went back to his old ways. So the emperor turned around, went back to Rome, and removed John XII. Have you ever heard about the Pope being removed? It's certainly uncanonical. You cannot remove a Pope. That's uncanonical. However, we're quite understandable, though, uh, but uncanonical. And then the Emperor appointed another man, and he called himself Leo VIII. Guess what you find in the Annuario Pontificio. You find the uncanonical removement of John XII as the end of his papacy, and you find Leo VIII as his successor. In the Honorary Pontificio, it doesn't say anti-pope. Now, today people run around, and, and I mean, uh, in every part of this country, you will find 50,000 people who tell you about anti-popes. Not so the church. Of course, later on, poor Leo, the, Leo VIII had to escape Rome, and John XII came back, literally, with a vengeance. <coughs> now we come to the one of the most amusing parts of papal history, Pope Benedict the Ninth. It certainly made me laugh when I saw what the Annuario Pontificio had to say about Benedict the Ninth. But let's find out. Benedict the Ninth was elected in 2000 or appointed. I don't remember in those days elections appointments. Who cares? It was same thing. He was uh, made Pope in 1032. In 1044, 12 years later, the Romans were so sick and tired of him that they chased him away. <laughs> the Romans have never been known for being shy. I've learned my lesson in Rome, 15 years. And they just chased him away. Now, you wouldn't call that canonical, right? He was chased away. So then, uh, a certain John, Bishop of Sabina, who had truckloads of money, bought the papacy from uh, Benedict the Ninth. Now, Benedict the Ninth, uh, he was a crook. He was a horrible character, but he was not stupid. He said, I gotta have something to live out my old age. So uh, he said, okay, okay, I'll abdicate, but uh, I, 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 I gotta have some reward. So Bishop John of Sabina bought the papacy. He was well-intentioned. He thought he would help the church that way. And he bought himself into the, into the position of Sylvester III, Pope Sylvester III. He gloriously reigned from January 1045 until March 1045. <laughs> In came Benedict IX, again with a vengeance, retook the papal see, and then gloriously reigned from March 1045 until May 1045. <laughs> then, uh, Sylvester was sent back to the poor Sylvester III, who was John of Sabina. He was sent back to his diocese, and uh, again, uh, Benedict IX was kindly uh, invited to leave Rome. So this time he sold the papacy to the Archpriest of St. Mary Majors, Saint, uh, uh, a certain Johannes Gratianus. 
He called himself Gregory VI and gloriously reigned from 1045 until 1046. In 1046, a pseudo-synod of Sutri, I mean, it wasn't really officially called by the Pope, it was a synod where bishops came together under the influence of the emperor. It was, it's called the Synod of Sutri, took place in 1046. And uh, on that point, Sylvester was called non-Pope, the one of Sabina, the first one to buy his job. Gregory, the second one, Gregory VI, uh, was called non-Pope, sent back, sent back to St. Mary Majors. And in came, for the third time, Benedict. This time the Romans didn't hesitate. Benedict came in, the Romans went out and chased them away for the final time. The emperor then nominated the bishop of Bamberg in Germany. He nominated him pope under the name of Clement II. Now aren't you curious to see what the Honoraria Pontificio has to say about that? <laughs> The Honorable Pontificio says the following. Benedict IX, for the first time, 1032 until 1044. Sylvester III, 1045, 1045. Benedict IX, for the second time, 1045, 1045. Gregory VI, 1045, 1046. Benedict IX, for the third time, 1046, and then finally Clement II. This is what the other Honorary Pontificio says. So I would suggest to the next one who tells me that uh, John the 23rd wasn't really elected or stuff like that, uh, to remember how church looks at how the church looks at such happenings. Let's say John the 23rd got to the papacy through some evil means. He was never elected. Poor Cardinal Siri was told if he would ever say that he was elected, he would be shot. And let's say this was the case. Even then, church history would consider him Pope. There you go. <laughs> and uh, the next one on my list, another one appointed by the emperor when that whole mess with the Benedict, with the three Benedicts who were the same person, was over. Uh, the emperor appoint. I, I, I made a mistake here. I apologize. This is confusing to me too, even though I have a list here. Uh, yes. Uh, after the second time, Benedict IX, he was followed by the Bishop of Bamberg, who called himself Clement II. And then in came from 1047 until 1048. Sorry about that. Benedict IX for the third time. And now the emperor finally had had it, and he made Popo von Brixen, who was the bishop of Brixen, pope, who called himself Damasus II in 1048. And now finally, that chaos and confusion was concluded, and it's so amusing to see in the Annuari Pontificio, which is, list, which is written in, in Italian, uh, Benedetto IX per la prima volta, then the other pope, then Benedetto IX per la seconda volta, and then the other pope, and Benedetto IX per la terza volta. You think they're joking, but it's not Mad Magazine, it is the other one of the feature. The next pope after that was uh, Victor II. He was appointed by the Emperor Henry II, whose chancellor he was. Here we have an interesting thing. No, now the emperor is not what Gregory the Seventh later on will say about him, but the emperor is the emperor, not a cardinal. It was Saint Henry the Second who appointed non-saint Pope Victor the Second, but Henry the Second was canonized, July fifteenth. My third name. The next pope to consider is Saint Gregory the Seventh, who wrote heresy. He was pope from 1073 until 1085, and he wrote the most famous document in church history, probably, the Dictatus Pape, the dictate of the pope. Uh, Gregory the Seventh desperately attempted, after all those things where the emperor appointed the pope, the, pe the, uh, the emperor did away with the pope, 
he tried to explain to the emperor that he is really a nobody. That's what you call uh, to go to the other extreme. It's to throw out the baby with the bath. And that was a terrible mistake because it made him a heretic. Because in the Dictatus Pape, he not only says unacceptable things like the relation between the emperor and the pope is like between the lord and his swineherd. <laughs> I mean, uh, he was lucky I wasn't emperor. When Gregory VII had that famous clash with uh, the Emperor Henry IV of Germany and the Emperor Henry IV had to kneel barefooted in the snow in front of the castle of Canossa to apologize to the, uh, to the Pope and to have his excommunication taken away, history unanimously judges the Emperor to be the winner of that battle. Because after Gregory VII, the reputation of the papacy declined fast. And one of the reasons was, in the Dictatus Pape, he says, and it's hard to believe, but I checked it myself, I also actually, I've, I've held the original of the Dictatus Pape, the oldest original book in the Vatican secret archives, insured for a nominal $1 million, probably some Texans would pay $10 million for that book, I've held that book in my hand, so I know what I'm talking about. It's in the old writing there. He says, every single pope, now this is a teaching document of the papacy, every single pope, the moment he's validly elected, through the merits of St. Peter, is made a saint. <laughs> the Latin original is very clear, efficitur sanctus is made a saint. We will later on see how saintly those popes were. But it's heresy against the teaching of the church about grace. Because it would mean, if a cardinal is in mortal sin and gets elected pope, he's not in mortal sin anymore because he's just been made a saint. So he doesn't have to go to confession. The pope has to go to confession, but that cardinal who was just elected doesn't have to go to confession. So after all, Trent might have made a mistake. We might have eight sacraments. <laughs> Papal election being the eighth. <laughs> well, as we say in New York, certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> it is heresy, and of course I have absolutely no doubt about the fact that Gregory VII had no intention of writing heresy. However, he did. He wrote something against defined doctrine. And of course he wouldn't take it back, that is for sure. Not Gregory VII. Not Hildebrand, never. And uh, Saint Gregory VII was made a saint in the 17th century when the popes wanted to boost their image. I don't think it was a good idea to canonize a man who wrote, who wrote heresy. Now, it has never been said that a, that a saint cannot make mistakes. Saint Ambrose did, for example. But to canonize a pope who wrote such a ridiculous heresy? That the Pope is made, made a saint the moment of his valid election? A canonical election can saintly, saint one somebody? Can turn him into a saint? Yes, he says, through the merits of St. Peter, well, that's a cheap phrase. It is a very grave thing he wrote there. A feature to a sanctus. You can imagine the theologians of the time must, must have died laughing if they didn't cry. <laughs> Now, uh, many people are concerned about uh, a vacancy in the Apostolic See. I don't know anything about that, but in tw between 1268 and 1271, the church didn't have a pope. For three years, the church had no pope. It continued anyway. The next on my list is Boniface VIII, a very sorry character. Uh, he reigned from 1294 until 1303. Very arrogant man. And something that, uh, I mean, I'm not a politically correct person. I prefer to be right rather than politically correct. But to insult a cripple, or you would say uh, something challenged anyway, to insult a cripple is not exactly a Christian action. If somebody was a midget, Boniface VIII would make him the point of laughter in his court. If somebody was one-legged, he'd be the point of, of, of humor in, in, in Boniface's court. You, you see, from, from uh, 
the human deficiencies like that, one shouldn't be surprised then when one finds that the same person who ridiculed cripples, who was arrogant against anybody and everybody, and who was a, a terrible nepotist, anything he could lay hands on, money, property, would go to his family, the Gaetani family. And uh, he was name was Benedetto Gaetani before he was elected, and uh, he continued uh, under the name of Boniface VIII to be very, very much of a Gaetani. He made sure the Gaetanis got rich. No wonder, then, if um, somebody who misbehaves like that and certainly was a zero charity person, in his bull, Unam Sancta, in 1302, he wrote several heresies. The first one was the theory of the two swords. He denied the emperor the temporal reign. He said there is the sword of the spiritual power and there is the sword of the temporal power. And I hold both. <laughs> Unfortunately, it needed until Leo XIII to correct on this point. Leo XIII, in his social encyclicals, is very clear about uh, Boniface VIII having made a mistake here. The problem is, he didn't just let it stay at that. Uh, in the sanction, now, when a pope writes up a decree, there is a chapter, it's called the sanctions, where he says, whosoever doesn't believe that, anathema sit. Whosoever uh, contradicts that is outside the church. In his sanction, he says, Whoever contradicts him is a Manichaean. <laughs> now the Manichaeans were the people who said everything material is evil. That's a blasphemy, of course, because it means the material creation is, in, is, is through, mortals, uh, through original sin, of course, but through original sin the entire material creation is evil. That's still a blasphemy. God doesn't create things that turn into evil uh, through a sin. As a matter of fact, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches res nunquam mala. No thing as such is ever evil. Actions are evil and intentions are evil, but things are not evil. Because everything, whether it is I speaking, whether it is my speech organ moving, whether it's the glass of wine standing here not toppling over or disappearing, has to thank God for its existence in every single split second, every moment. Of course it is impossible that God ceases to exist, but if God ceased to exist, we would be gone in the same moment. <coughs> gone. So everything that is thanks his existence to God. Therefore a thing cannot be bad. Now this Pope says, he wasn't even talking about a thing. He was talking about one of his erroneous opinions. If you did not accept the theory of the two swords, you were a Manichaean. This is patent nonsense, and at the same time it's heretical against the teaching against the Manichaeans. Well, of course, uh, it's logical that he would be the one person who would say it is necessary for salvation to be a subject to the Roman Pontiff. If he meant to say, in matters of faith and morals, I would say, yes, sir. Yes, holiness. But in everything? The Pope cannot tell me uh, uh, not to drink wine, for example. He cannot do that, because it's not immoral. And he cannot tell me to, to, to abandon something that's not immoral. I don't owe him obedience. The Pope cannot tell George Bush on how to run the White House. He can tell George Bush to keep the commandments, but he cannot tell George Bush on how to run the White House. He doesn't have that power. So, in order to be saved, we have, of course, we have to follow the commandments of Christ. We have to follow church teaching, but we don't have to be subjects to the Roman Pontiff. This was one of the causes of the later catastrophe of obedience. It was prophesied that Satan would try to de destroy the church using the structure of obedience. But this is what we are facing today. Then came Clement the Fifteenth. Clement the Fifteenth was a, a good man, didn't teach any heresy, but he did something that the Bishop of Rome cannot do. He stayed in exile in Avignon. 
and it was he who caused the exile of Avignon, which lasted for 70 years. The Pope is first of all the Bishop of Rome, and therefore has to stay in Rome. Clement the Fifteenth did not do that. Why do I mention this? It was just a mistake, right? Oh, well, some people today say the Pope is infallible also in his pastoral actions. Well, the Pope is obviously not infallible in his pastoral actions because it's certainly against his pastoral duty to abandon his diocese. And we will see an example later on for the same problem. Then comes John the 22nd. Now John the 22nd is the most famous example of a pope who erred. At the same time, I consider him a learned man and a saint. John the 22nd was everything a saint required. He was everything an erudite person requires. He was one of the most educated popes in history, except for one single erroneous idea, which he took back the day before his death. So as far as I'm concerned, John the 22nd cannot be blamed. He said that the souls of the dead cannot go to heaven and, he and hell before the last judgment. Well, we know that's not true. At the time, it had not yet been defined doctrine, but the church taught it. So everybody was shocked when John the 22nd said what he said. He actually wrote it down. He, wrote, he even wrote a book about it. Remember, he was living in Avignon. And uh, he sent uh, his ideas to the University of Paris, Paris, which of course they were furious. They said, how, how dare you say such things? However, December 4th of 1334, the day before he died, he took it back, left it up to his successor to uh, correct. And two years later, Benedict XII did correct it and said, no, that's not true. We have to believe that the, the souls of the dead immediately upon the personal judgment, go to purgatory, hell, or heaven. Then comes Urban VI. Now, the exile of Avignon is over. St. Catherine of Siena finally prevails in telling the popes, you will come back to Rome, your place is Rome, you have to come back to Rome. Don't listen to those snakes of cardinals, I'm quoting St. Catherine. Don't listen to those snakes, come back to Rome. Well. Urban VI did. He was elected in Rome in 1378. His name was Bartolomeo Prignano and he was from Napoli. The Neapolitan, Neapolitan popes have always given problems to the church and uh, he was the, one of the first ones to do so. His personality was so disgusting that the cardinals finally, even though it was a perfectly obvious uh, valid conclave, and he certainly was Pope, he was so disgusting that the only way the Cardinals found to get rid of him, short from murder, was to declare his election invalid. <laughs> Which they did. They came together in Avignon again and elected their own Pope. Now, that's one who in the Annuario Pontificio, thank God, is really called anti-Pope, so we don't have to be confused about that. Anti-Pope Clement VII lived as a pseudo-Pope from 1378 until 1394. Now we have an interesting situation. St. Catherine of Siena said, Urban VI is Pope and Clement VII is the devil's anti-Pope. In came St. Vincent Ferrer and said, Urban VI in Rome is the anti-Pope and the devil's creature and Clement VII is the real Pope. So who was right? Well, St. Catherine was right. Uh, Vincent Ferrer was wrong. But again, you can become a saint if you were wrong. Urban VI was followed by Boniface IX from 1389 to 1404, who was followed by Innocent VII from 1404 until 1406, who was followed by uh, Gregory the Twelfth from 1406 until 1415. Meanwhile, the Avignon line continued. The moment anti-Pope Clement the Seventh died, anti-Pope Benedict the Thirteenth was elect, elected, who uh, gloriously didn't reign from 1394 until 1417. Now, what happened in between? 
In 1409, a so-called council got together in Pisa. You know what the crooked tower, that town? Uh, they got together in Pisa. They declared the Pope in Rome and the Pope in Avignon non-Pope and elected their own. Alexander V, from 1409 until 1410, who was followed, a joke of history, by John the 23rd, in 1410 until 1415. Now we gloriously had three popes in Europe. At the same time, there was an emperor and two other people who said, I am the emperor. So Europe was divided between three popes and three emperors. People talk about the situation today. <laughs> Back then, they believed this was the last judgment. All of Europe started processions in prayer and said, we better prepare because the, the Lord is near. Most people at the time were, con I'm talking about most faithful, most faithful were convinced this was the end of times. Three popes, three emperors. Well, in 1414, the Council of Constance was called where all the three popes were treated equally. Just that is ridiculous. All three popes were treated equally. The council was, over, was above the popes, therefore. And indeed, the Council of Constance said, while the pope is above a council, in situations like this, a council is above the popes. That's heresy. And finally, the great Occidental Schism was laid by in 1417, when finally Benedict XIII decided to abdicate. After him came Pope Martin V, 1417-1431, and Eugene IV, 1431 until 1447. Both of them signed the Concilia Heresy. The heresy that in a church crisis or a schism, an ecumenical council would be above the papacy. Martin V signed it, Eugene IV signed it. Do I hear we, have, we don't have a pope since then? No? Good. Because the Annuari Pontificia recognizes both. And as a matter of fact, the church later on recognized that same council that had started in Constance, but in order to avoid uh, a scandal, they called it the Council of Florence, where it actually had one session, I think, or two, for a few years. It was, uh, it was a nomad council. I mean, it walked from Constance all the way down to Florence, from Florence to Pisa, from Pisa to, uh, I think, uh, um, I, I forgot, it's, it's been in so many places, but it's called the Council of Florence. For those who like sources, Eugene IV signed this Concilio Heresy in the encyclical Etsi non dubitemus. It's not on the in, it's not in Denzinger because Denzinger usually doesn't uh, write up heresies. Now we have pretty much come over the the popes who were heretics. Now we come into the age of the rotten popes. Starting with, I will not go into details here because ladies are present. Pope Innocent VIII, 1484 until 1492, not only had children, he legitimized his children, which, as Hilaire Belloc says so well, means ridiculing celibacy. And that's right. It's one thing to sin and have children, it's another thing to abuse papal power to legitimize these children. He not only legitimized these children, he sent them their wedding in his palace. Glorious family reunion. In Italia, la familia. <laughs> he was followed by Alexander VI, who did the same. Then came uh, Pope Julius II, who was actually a good pope, between 1503 and 1513. I forgot poor Pius III, who was pope for two months and died. And then came Leo X, who did the same. All of these popes, Leo X was a Medici. The, the great Tuscan family from Florence, or as they would say, Toscana. Uh, anything he could lay hands on. Money, property, anything. Went to his family. 
And then came Leo X's nephew, Clement VII. He was Pope from 1523 until 1534. His lifestyle, his lifestyle was correct. He didn't do anything. He didn't. Uh, he didn't have children. He uh, didn't legitimize illegitimate children. He didn't set the wedding for his children in his own palace, and he didn't do all the other, the other, as we say in Italian, porcherie. Uh, he didn't do all those dirty things that uh, his predecessors did. But the two greatest papal historians, Leopold von Ranke and Ludwig Pastor, both call his pontificate the most infelicitous in church history. Why? Now, Clement VII was what you call in Latin a conctator, a hesitator. He said, I don't know, ah, well, let's see, I'm not sure I should do this. Eh. And today he said this, tomorrow he said another thing. Uh, he was timid, changed around. At the same time, he kept himself awfully busy assigning money and property a la familia. Of course, he was a Medici, he was his uncle's nephew. And uh, what happened? When Clement VII became Pope in 1523, Europe was Catholic. When he died in 1534, a third of Europe had gone Protestant. In 11 years pontificate, he lost a third of Europe. And then came Paul IV. He was Pope from 1555 until 1559, which is exactly the time the Council of Trent, direly needed after the Reformation, was interrupted. Paul IV, Neapolitano again, from Naples, he was on one hand the pious figure, we know that, from somewhere else. On the other hand, he was extremely arrogant, he was absolutely, totally insane about his own papal dignity, and he was a certifiable medical case of paranoia. <laughs> Very hard character. For him, it was enough to be suspect of heresy, and he would be arrested. Even though he appointed his nephew, Carafa, to Secretary of State, his nephew betrayed him wherever he could, amassed a fortune while he was in that, in that job. But you couldn't speak to Paul IV about it. He wouldn't have it, he wasn't going to listen to you, he would not even receive you. The next Pope in history who wouldn't receive cardinals was Pius XII. It was a rare, very rare, a, a, a Pope would refuse to receive his own cardinals. He had, for example, one poor Cardinal Morone was called into the papal's audience. He never saw the Pope. He was arrested, locked up, never found out why he was suspected of heresy. The same Paul IV was also the one who issued the, the papal bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, that determined that a former heretic could not become Pope. The set of the, um, what, I, what, I should, what I really should for practical purposes, not passing any judgment on anyone here, but for practical purposes, I should say the 1958 set of a Those who believe that John XXIII was not Pope, because before he was elected, he was a heretic. Now, the 1958 set of a contest do not realize that the papal bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, was a document that was basically null and void. It wasn't dogmatic at all, as they say. The next pope who, who uh, wrote about the laws of how to elect the pope didn't even mention cum ex apostolatus officio. And the papal practice was even worse. While Paul IV in cum ex apostolatus officio says a former heretic cannot become pope, privately he made sure that every cardinal understood that a one who was formerly suspect of heresy could not become pope. Now, Leo XIII beautifully contradicted that when he made the former heretic, John Henry Newman, Cardinal John Henry Newman. So, Leo XIII, theoretically, 
made a former heretic, John Henry Newman, uh, Anglican priest, Anglican minister, minister, who converted Catholic, became a Catholic priest. John um, Leo the Thirteenth made him made him John Henry Cardinal Newman. Therefore, he was eligible to the papacy. Out goes Cum ex opostulatus officio, written by a paranoid pope anyway. Paul IV was also an excellent example of why Christ decided in the 17th century, actually in 1600, in the 1680s, to reveal his most sacred heart to Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque and why he told the French king to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, which the French king of course did not do, because of course the Jesuit counseled him not to do so. Uh, and of course, on the day, on the same day, 100 years later, the French Revolution started. The French Revolution didn't start on July 14th, as the, as the French would like to have it. It started on, if I remember well, June, June in any case, but if I remember well on June 17th, when the states, the different states of society, a sort of parliament, uh, were dissolved, that's when the French Revolution started. That was on, on the day, 100 years after, uh, Louis XIV did not consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Why the Sacred Heart? Well, the heart stands for love. Do you say I love you with all of my will? No. Do you say I love you with all of my intellect? No. You say I love you with all of my heart. This is exactly what popes like Paul IV so direly lacked. Now, whatever you hear about the Inquisition is usually written up by Protestant English. And there is a whole bunch of lies in it and uh, slander. It's, uh, it's what I call a mass production of, li of lie and slander. But the Roman Inquisition, which was a basically charitable institution, believe it or not, under Paul IV was anything but charitable. It was very easy in those days for Roman families to get rid of enemies. All they would have to do is make sure the Pope heard that Cardinal so-and-so of the enemy family uh, had said, had pronounced heresy. That made him suspect of heresy, so he would arrest it. As the above mentioned Cardinal Morone said, he, he, he was told he was uh, arrested because he was suspect of heresy. He said, well, what? What? He never found out. He was in prison, luxurious prison in Castel San Angelo, but still in prison. He was in prison until finally, for, uh, a couple of years later, Paul IV died, and the cardinals unanimously decided to have poor Cardinal Morone participate in the, next, in the next conclave, because they were all convinced this was unjust. Now, it doesn't befit the Pope to arrest people and not, tell, not even tell them why. The Pope is subject to canon law. There is some papalists running around who say the Pope is above canon law. No, he is not. He may change canon law, but he's not above it. The Pope is a vice president in the church, not the president. That's Christ. The Pope is the vicar. Some people don't know what the word vicar means. Well, vicar is vice president. After that, we have another example that the Pope's uh, pastoral decisions are not infallible. Clement XIV dissolved the Jesuit order. I'm very grateful to him. And Pius VII reintroduced the Jesuit order. Now, to dissolve a religious order or to found a religious order is a pastoral act. You can easily see. It's an act of the shepherd. He wants the flock to be learned, taught in the catechism. The Jesuits have done, indeed, great missionary work. So, uh, I forgot which Pope, uh, for the first time, have confirmed the Jesuit order. Clement XIV, anyway, dissolved it, and Pius VII reintroduced it. So, papal pastoral acts, therefore, are not infallible. Now comes one of my best friends among the Popes, because he had a great sense of humor, Pius IX. And here we also have an excellent proof of the humor of God. Sixteen years before Pius IX had papal infallibility defined infallibly, 
Pius IX in his dogma of the Immaculate Conception, not as to the dogma as such, but in the decree <coughs> in Ephabilis Deus of 1854, made an error against church doctrine. Now, not as far as the Immaculate Conception is concerned. That is protected by the Holy Spirit because that is actually the dogma. <coughs> but you heard me talk about sanctions. After the dogma, it says what happens to those who don't believe it. I give you literally what Pius IX wrote in the Fabulous Deus. Should, therefore, which God may prevent, some dare to think, some dare to think, otherwise in their heart, than what we have defined, so they may recognize and know further that they, judged by their own sentence, have lost their faith and their unity with the church. Uh -uh. I say again, some dare to think otherwise in their heart. In all of the councils throughout history, from the very first council until Vatican I, in all the 20 ecumenical councils, and in all papal dogmas, the canons read, Si quis dixerit, if one was to say. This is the only exception. It says some dare to think otherwise in their heart. That is against church doctrine defined at the Council of Trent. For those who like sources, Denzinger 1814, where it says, De occultis ecclesia non judicat about the hidden things the church does not judge. Now, are thoughts hidden, yes or no? Of course they are. Innocent the 11th, I should say blessed Innocent the 11th, in number 66 <coughs> against the Molinarists says the same thing. And after a past the ninth, Leo the 13th in Apostolic Cicure, 1896, he says about, oops, about the attitude and the intention the church does not judge. So Pius IX committed a theological error against uh, church teaching when he said, if some, if, uh, I abbreviate his speech, should therefore some dare to think otherwise in their heart. He cannot say that, Pope or not. He has no right to judge the thoughts of the faithful. But he says, should some dare to think otherwise in their heart? I think it's a great example of God's humor. Sixteen years before infallibility was pronounced, he shows us the limits of infallibility. The papal infallibility is guaranteed as to the dogma as such, not to the rest. So even in a decree that is in itself dogmatic, there can be an error, as you can see. It's obvious, the church before and after taught that we cannot judge the thoughts. Now you might think, well probably uh, he meant to say that if you, in, in your heart, you denied the Immaculate Conception, you would have to go to confession. True, but the church cannot judge you being outside the church. The church is a visible institution. You cannot invisibly leave the church. The church has always, has always defined the contrary of what Pius IX says here. And I think that's a precious example. Why does God allow such errors? Well, to show us the limits. This is exactly what we are lacking today, is the understanding of the limits of papal power. And then we come to some uh, misdemeanors in the, in the 20th century. Some people today are scandalized when the Pope uh, changes the liturgy or when he omits certain Catholic doctrines in order to please some heretics who are present, uh, maybe at his Mass. And they can't understand why he does that and they think that's something very new. Take an educated guess of when it happened the first time that a Pope would omit the filioque in the creed for the sake of other people present. Now the filioque is an essential part of the creed, an essential part to the understanding of the Most Blessed Trinity. When it says, 
begotten from the Father and the Son. It's this very and the Son, in Latin as usual, much shorter, filioque. This very filioque is one of the cornerstones of the understanding of the Most Blessed Trinity. You scratch out the filioque, the Most Blessed Trinity collapses as if this was possible. The thing is, the only distinction within the Most Blessed Trinity is their relationship to each other. All, uh, I mean, all three are the same. God Father is Almighty, God Son is Almighty, God Holy Spirit is Almighty. All three are eternal. As a matter of fact, to cut things short, the Father can say, I am, the Son can say, I am, the Holy Spirit can say, I am. Nobody else can. If I say, I am, you would rightly look at me puzzled and say, what? Only God can say, I am, full stop. Three persons can say, I am. So what's the difference? Well, there's no difference between them, but there's a distinction. The distinction is their relationship. The Son is generated by the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Father is the one who generates the Son, and that's the Holy Spirit proceed. And the Son is the one who lets the Holy Spirit proceed, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. It's their relationship to each other that make the Trinity. You take out the filioque, and it's no Trinity anymore. Guess when it happened the first time that the papal high mass, in the Son solemn creed, the words filioque, upon the Pope's personal wish, were omitted. You'd never guess. It was on October 7th, 1930. 1930. October 7th, 1930. There were Russians present at the Papal Mass, and the Pope personally wanted that the, in the creed, the filioque, in order to please the Russians, the Russian Orthodox present, who deny the filioque, they're heretics. Pope Pius XI wanted to please them, and he insisted that the filioque will be cancelled. Back then, the prefect of the congregation dared to contradict the Pope, said, Holy Father, you cannot do that. The Holy Father, I can't do it because there's the microphone, banged the table and said, E la mia politica, oh, e la mia politica, oh. This is my policy. Well, it might come as a surprise to you, but actually the Ostpolitik, the famous Ostpolitik, where Catholic priests and Catholic doctrine are sacrificed to uh, conferences with the communists, the Ostpolitik is as old as the Soviet Union. <coughs> the famous German journalist Hans Jakob Steele, who is to be taken seriously in such enterprises, has written a book, Die Vatikanische Ostpolitik, from 1917 bis 1979. The Vatican Ostpolitik from 1917 until 1979. And the fact of past XI here is mentioned in that book too. You can also find it in Frère Michel de la Sainte Trinité, Fatima. There you will find all these things, so I'm not making up things. You want sources, you get them. Then, um, the next thing I have to cut short, Pius XII, in Mediator Dei, changed 180 degrees, the oldest liturgical principle in the Church, going back in writing until the year 250. And it says, Legend credendi lex statua supplicanti. The law of what has to be prayed may determine the law of what has to be believed, I explain. The Immaculate Conception was in the Roman Missal centuries before it became a dogma. What is the law of, to, of, of prayer? Well, first of all, the Roman Missal, then the Roman Breviary, and then all the approved liturgical books. They are the laws of prayer. What is the law of what has to be believed? Not to be confused with the depositum fide, the deposit of the faith, the faith as such. But what is the law of what has to be believed? Well, a dogma. So the law of what has to be prayed said centuries ago, that on December 8th you celebrate the Immaculate Conception. And then, on December 8th, 1854, it became a law to be believed. So the law of what has to be prayed may determine the law of what has to be believed. Without giving any reason whatsoever, Pius XII turns it around. In Mediator Day, number 37, 
You can read it yourself, you can research yourself. He does not explain why he turns around, he does turn it around. No wonder then that in the 10 year anniversary uh, booklet of the Fraternity of St. Peter, they refer exactly to that. And uh, there's some following quotations between uh, Mediator Day number 37 and, and 48 that show that Pope Pius XII confused his authority with the authority of the Church. The Church alone may govern <coughs> liturgy. Pius XII said, I, the Pope. It's not so. And in Humani Generis, 1950, Pope Pius XII said, but if the Supreme Pontiffs in their official acts purposely pass judgment on a matter debated until then, it is obvious to all, according to the mind and will of the same Pontiffs, that the matter cannot be considered any longer a question open to free discussion among theologians. Oh, oh. how about all those mistakes I just listed? Those were all papal acts, official papal acts. I read again. But if the Supreme Pontiffs in their official acts purposely pass judgment, etc., the matter cannot be considered any longer a question open to free discussion among theologians. If he means to say free discussion in the sense that we just wantonly ignore what the Pope says and continue discussing, well, he would be right. But in the context, with everything else he says, it is quite clear that he means it cannot be discussed anymore. Well, that's ridiculous. That means that the ordinary judgment of the, of the Pope is infallible. Well, we know it's not. And I recommend to read, uh, to read the decree of, the infallible, of infallibility. It's uh, the Constitutio, Prima, the Constitutio Dogmatica Prima, Pastor Eternus de Ecclesia Christi, of the 18th July 1870. You will find it in Denzinger Schönmetzer 3050 until 3070, and in the 35th edition, pages 595 following. And in the fourth chapter it says, only if in virtue of his apostolic authority, he teaches something to, held, to be held by the universal church, only then can he be infallible. If we examine the, uh, the written acts of the present Pope, we will find one that seems to be like that, and that's when he says women cannot receive priestly ordination. That's the only time he ever uses that formula that one would consider infallible. So, at the end of this conference, I will give you a short outline of the limits of the papal office. Before I do that, I have to quote two ridiculous quotations, but just to show you how far what I call papalism has gone. What I call papalism is when somebody says the Pope cannot make a mistake, the Pope is always right. We have seen through history that that is certainly, most certainly not the case. <laughs> Bishop Gaspard Mermillot in 1870 said, there are three sanctuaries, the crib, the tabernacle, and the Vatican. <laughs> containing God, Jesus Christ, and the Pope. <laughs> Today, Jesus Christ is in the form of the Pope. There are three incarnations of the Son of God, in the womb of the Virgin, in the Eucharist, and in the Pope. A friend of mine who is a very good theologian said, don't worry, it's not blasphemy, it's, not blasphemy. it's far too stupid for that. <laughs> but if you take it literally, it is blasphemy. Three incarnations of Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin, in the Eucharist, and in the Pope? <laughs> what will she say about it? Don Bosco, Saint Don Bosco said, the Pope is God on earth. Jesus has set the Pope above the prophets, above his precursor, St. John the Baptist, above the angels. Jesus has placed the Pope on a level with God. 
Again, I hope it's not blasphemy, <coughs> it's only stupid. This quotation is from Meditazioni, Volume 1, pages 89 to 90. That's how far we have come. Sad to say. The Pope is God. No wonder there's so many Sede Vacantists who refuse to believe that the present Pope is Pope, or Paul VI was Pope, or John XXIII was Pope. Whatever reasons they have, uh, if you read this, you would, you would think that we, uh, we, well, we are in Sede's vacancy since probably 904. <laughs> probably we, we haven't had a Pope for more than a thousand years. But what are we going to do about it? Nothing. Now, the limitation of the Pope's office is mostly given in the Oath of Incoronation. I must correct a widespread error about the Papal Oath of Incoronation. People sometimes tell me, they don't ask me, they tell me, oh, this must be a bad Pope because he never swore the Oath of Incoronation. As a matter of fact, he refused to swear it. Not true. The last time the Pope, uh, a Pope signed the Oath of Incoronation, that was exactly Benedetto Gaetani, Boniface VIII, in, in 1302. The point about the Oath of Incoronation lies absolutely elsewhere. The first time that it was most definitely signed by the Pope and sent to all the heads of states in Europe, kings, queens, emperors, was in 678 and it was signed by Pope Saint Agatha I. Now, we have to understand, uh, St. Agatha I signed it and was the first one to incorporate the Oath of Incoronation in the Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. That's a sort of yearbook for the popes. It's like uh, the President's brief at 7 in the morning. Uh, the Pope, if, if, he, if he doesn't know, and usually he doesn't, if he doesn't know how to do the blessing on Easter Sunday and Christmas, he will look into the Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. If the Pope doesn't know how to celebrate Papal Mass, because that's quite different from an Episcopal High Mass, from a Pontifical High Mass, the Pope, for example, when he raises the host, in ancient tradition he shows the host to all four directions of the earth. In St. Peter's he's looking like in all good churches, in all real churches, he's looking east, he doesn't face the people. That's nonsense. The Pope never faced the people. That's nonsense. The, the altar in St. Peter's is directed towards the east because the entrance to St. Peter's is in the east and the apse of St. Peter's is in the west. Usually it's the other way around. And that's why the, Pope, why the, why the priest usually faces the altar and not, not the entrance to the church. The Pope, however, in St. Peter's faces the entrance to the church because he faces like all celebrants in all real churches east. However, he shows the host to the east, the south, the west, and the north. That's a significant difference between the papal high mass and pontifical high mass. All these things that concern only the pope are collected in the uh, Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. I am able to say the things I say here because I was lucky with the help of the prefect of the Vatican Secret of the Vatican Library. I could lay hands on a French edition of the Liber Diurnus of the 19th century. Now the important thing is this. Saint Agatha I definitely signed this oath, and this was 678. The last one to sign it was in 1302. We're talking about almost 600 years. So for 600 years, and I'm sure it was 600 because long before Saint Agatha, that oath must have existed. It just wasn't in the Liber Diurnus yet, or in no written record. For more than 600 years, most probably, the Pope signed this Oath of Incoronation. After that, after 1302, no Pope signed it anymore, in the sense that he didn't send it to the Emperor. But it is still today in the Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. So for 600 years, all popes approved of what I'm going to read you now, and for another, for another 700 years, no pope ever dared to contradict it. It was never taken out of the Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. As a matter of fact, it is still there. So to all those people in this country who tell me this vicious pope now uh, refused to, to, to swear it, I would say this vicious Pius XI refused to swear it, and this vicious Pius X refused to swear it. Well, it's the same untruth. 
None of them refused. It is still in the, in the, in the, it is understood as a matter of fact, or it, let's say, let's be realistic. It's not understood at all as far as the popes are concerned. However, it is church doctrine. No pope has ever contradicted it. It has been taught indirectly for 600 years, never been contradicted. That's usually you consider such a thing, you would say, Ecclesia, Ecclesia Profitetur. The Church professes it, the Church believes it. Now listen to this and look what all the popes that I mentioned today did. There is a slight difference. The Pope is not talking yet as Pope. The last one who signed, Boniface VIII, signed the papal oath of incoronation with his own name, Benedetto Gaetani. I, Benedetto Gaetani, or I, Carol Wittiva, <coughs> swear that I will not reduce, change, or permit anything new in anything that I found of my God-pleasing predecessors. Rather, to conserve reverently with glowing devotion as their faithful pupil and successor with all of my power and effort the handed down deposit to cleanse everything that might arise in contradiction of canonical order to safeguard the holy canons and laws of our popes as divine instructions from heaven since I am conscious that I will have to give strictest justification about everything that I confess, confess back then meant say, everything that I confess at the divine judgment and to you whose place I possess through divine grace and whose vicariate I occupied with your support. Should I undertake to act in anything in another sense or should I permit that this is done, then you will not show your mercy to me on that terrible day of the divine judgment. Arina ding ding. <laughs> and later on in the letter that he usually sent to the empress, he says, as Pope now, therefore we submit also to the exclusion under the strictest ban, whomsoever might dare, whether it is us or anyone else, whether it is us or anyone else, to undertake anything new or in contradiction to this such like evangelical tradition and the purity of the Orthodox faith and the Christian religion, or who should attempt through his adversarial efforts to change anything or to hide anything from the purity of the faith or to agree with whomsoever should undertake such a blasphemous audacity. That is what the Church believes about the Pope. Now, you can see from this oath of incoronation that we have two things that are quite confusing today suddenly explained. First of all, obviously the papal infallibility is very restricted. Because when we go through history, think of Nicholas I with baptism, think of Gregory VII with his heretical statement about popes becoming saints at the moment of election, which is also patently absurd. Uh, when we, see, uh, when we see these things, we realize the papal infallibility is very limited, on one hand. On the other, even the most heretical popes, even the worst scoundrels of popes, are still counted as popes in the Annuare Pontificio. So it is extremely difficult, to say the least, to prove that any one of the recent popes wasn't pope. It's extremely difficult, at least. And uh, <coughs> the same people who elevate canon law to an almost dogmatical state, which is nonsense. Law can never be dogma. The same people who elevate canon law to a dogmatical state forget the Latin term, onus probandi, the burden of proof. If we look at John Paul II with his sometimes very questionable actions like kissing the Quran, it is still our burden of proof to say he is not Pope. Well, uh, allow me a personal 
opinion here, short and succinct. You know what I believe? If we have enough time left for a real church history about the 20th and 21st century, the church will name John Paul II as one of the many popes, and some future council will condemn. That's what I personally believe. If you don't agree, I'll forgive you. <laughs> now, in short, and to the point, because it's late, the limits of papal power systematically sink. There's the natural law. Can the Pope turn black into white? No. According to St. Ignatius of Loyola, yes. St. Ignatius of Loyola, I quote him literally, what seems to me white, I will believe black if the hierarchical church so determines it. That's against natural law. If the Pope says the earth is flat, I will tell him no. And he's not going to make me say the earth is flat. And if the Pope says that a tree grows upside down, I will say not usually. And if the Pope tells me black is white, I will say sorry pontiff, that's not true. St. Robert Bellarmine, I will save his reputation by giving more quotations, don't worry. St. Robert Bellarmine, at one point, when he must have been drunk or something like that, he says, if the Pope errs by commanding vices or forbidding virtues, the Church must believe that vices are good and virtues bad, unless it wishes to sin against conscience. Toodaloo. <laughs> Welcome to the Nuthouse. Well, fortunately, the same Bellarmine thinker in his, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> in, his, in his treatise, the Romano Pontifice, he says, the Pope can fall into heresy. First. Second, unjust laws of the Pope do not bind in conscience. The Pope is neither to the temporal ruler of the world, he is neither the temporal ruler of the world, nor the Christian world. See? He's not even the temporal ruler of the Christian world, contrary to what Boniface VIII said. And he has the supreme temporal power only indirectly, Name, namely telling George Bush to keep the Ten Commandments. Then there's the limit of divine law. The Pope cannot change the sacraments. Pope Innocent III said, if a, if a future pope was to change the rights of the sacraments, he would put himself outside the church. That's a papal pronouncement, Innocent III. And Innocent III was a good pope. St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote to Eugene III, De Consideratione, 4th book, 23. Remember above all things that the Holy Roman Church, over which God has established you as head, is the mother, the mother, and not the mistress of other churches. And that you are not the Lord of bishops, but one of their number. Now, St. Bernard was not a heretic. He meant it. The Pope is one of the bishops, except he has the last word. The primacy of the Pope is not that the Pope is Bishop of Baltimore, Bishop of Washington, Bishop of Chicago. The primacy of the Pope is he has the last word. The bishops rule their dioceses, and every five years report to the Pope afterwards. When uh, Pius IX in 1870 defined the papal infallibility, uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Bismarck, was furious. So the German bishops had to explain what Pius IX didn't explain. The German bishops wrote to Bismarck and said, don't worry, if the, bishop of, if the Archbishop of Cologne dies, the Pope does not become Archbishop of Cologne. The Pope is not the Archbishop, is not the Bishop of Berlin. The Pope is not the Archbishop of München Freising. And, he ex and the German bishops explained that limit to the papacy. Thank God, Blessed Pius IX signed it. So it is papal teaching now. But it's sad enough that the German bishops had to explain what Pius IX failed to explain. <laughs> then, of course, there's the limit uh, to the papal power through ecclesiastical law. And I quote uh, one of, the, one of the, the most common moral theological books, uh, Prüma OP. Remember above all things that the Holy Roman Church over... I'm uh, sorry, beg your pardon, some wrong paragraph. Moral theology teaches that the, legis the legislator is subject to his own laws, if not by coercive power, force from outside, 
at least in the manner of a directive. Precepts that are unjust, null, harmful, do not require obedience, except for the sake of avoiding scandal. If it's an unimportant thing, then you would cause scandal not keeping it. Like if I, I as a diabetic, do not have to keep Friday, but I'm certainly not going to eat a steak publicly here on Friday, right? Because you wouldn't understand. Or anybody here who is over 60 doesn't have to keep it. But it, uh, it doesn't behoove a man uh, to sit here in front of all Catholics and uh, eat a steak on Friday just because he has the right to do it. And if a Spaniard is here, he will have to abstain from meat here too, even though in Spain he doesn't have to. Then there's the dogmatic limit to the papal power. Revelation, obvious. The deposit of faith, it's obvious. He cannot define what is in no way related to revelation. The Pope cannot issue a dogmatic definition that John Deere are the best tractors. Nothing runs like a deer. The Pope cannot define that. It has nothing to do with revelation. He has to stick most faithfully to tradition. He cannot introduce any novelty. And he has to follow the previous doctrinal decisions of, of, uh, previous, of his predecessors. Gregory says, we believe we hold the first four councils on the level of the gospel. And then, of course, there are practical limits to papal power, <coughs> politics, disease, blackmail. A pope can be blackmailed into do something. Sure. Stupidity. If the pope is one of those cases, born dumb, learned nothing, forgot everything, and still elected pope, his limited intelligence will put a limit on his papal office. That's very obvious. We have seen the many cases where vices kept the Pope from doing his duty. Think of Clement VII. What was Clement VII's vice? Vice, he didn't even have women and children and stuff like that. All he did was no. he was so busy with the money for his family that he couldn't really watch a certain Dr. Martin Luther in the north of Germany and lost one-third of Christianity. So, on those limits of the papal power, you can easily see, and I've given you a skeleton of what has to be said about it. Because otherwise we'd be sitting here until 3 o'clock in the morning. I've, give you, I've given you a skeleton. Make sure you get your tapes from uh, him and him. Uh, make sure you get your tapes so you can study it again and uh, think further, because I just mentioned I'll do it again. Politics, disease, blackmail, stupidity, and vices. That's what came to my mind as the practical limits to papal authority. And that's something to be considered very seriously. Does that mean you have the right to condemn a stupid pope? No. Especially not if he's stupid, because if he's stupid, it's not his fault. God distributes intelligence. We get a chance to train our intelligence, and many people omit that chance. But... Uh, it's God's to give us intelligence or not. Some uh, saints, some of the greatest saints, were most definitely stupid. The uh, Saint John Maria Vianney, the parish priest, the, 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 the curé d'Ars, uh, he was very stupid. He had incredibly diffi incredible difficulties in his theological studies. He just couldn't put things together. And he was working hard, very hard. He wrote hours on a sermon. Uh, I just walk up the pulpit, say, in nomini patris filio spiritus sancti, and start to speak. That's a gift from God. If I praise myself for it, I am stupid. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the fact that St. John Maria Vianney on this point was stupid. So, he had the gift of introspection. He would tell you in the confessional, your last confession was not 15 years ago, it was 23 years ago, and you didn't come back to church because of this and that and that and that. And by the way, you forgot to mention the following three mortal sins. Da -da, da -da, da -da. <laughs> so that stupid man has been given the gift of introspection. He was the most famous confessor in contemporary France, and he is a saint, which I will never be. I will never be a canonized saint. I'm, I'm happy if I'm the last one to, to, to sneak in. So don't condemn popes just because they were stupid. Uh, don't condemn anybody, as a matter of fact. Judge you not, that you not be judged. This whole lecture was about historical facts, 
and it was to clear up the confusion about present and future popes. It, it, you must understand that those poor sisters who probably went very well, who in the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s taught you obedience, 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 and the Pope is infallible anyway, obedience, obedience, that they were thoroughly wrong. Obedience is a great virtue, but a virtue is not just what the name says. Not every form of obedience is a virtue. In that case, all the concentration camp guards would have been very virtuous because they did obey. Obedience is not a virtue as such. Obedience is a virtue in the light of the Catholic faith and especially, please, not just the faith. All I get to hear for the last 500 years is, do you believe it, yes or no? Are you faithful, yes or no? We should start to ask, are you charitable too? What's the only reason why we study God? Because we are curious and he is complicated? No, God is absolutely simple. Why do we study theology? Why do we have to study the catechism? Just to know things? That's not worth anything. It is whom we love we want to know about, right? Isn't that the most natural thing that when a man falls in love with a girl he wants to know everything about her? Naturally. And this is, this is the lesson from this uh, horrible parts of papal history, which doesn't mean there were not many saintly popes, there were many saintly popes. But the lesson we have to learn is the pope is neither infallible nor is he protected from sin. And most of the times his foremost sin is not to be a father but a boss. In these cases that I mentioned, most of the times it's, he was a boss, not a father. See, this is what you have to remember. When somebody calls me father, it is, it is a, a lot more difficult for me to swallow that compliment of being called a father. And when somebody says to me, oh, your lecture was wonderful and I enjoyed it so much, so what? Yes, okay. Uh, did, I, did I give myself that gift? No. The question is, am I a father? That's what we have to learn. Charity. That also means if we meet people who do not agree with us, we'll still love them. I mean, everyone here would be proud to convert somebody from a heresy into the Catholic Church, right? Well, I'll tell you one thing. At the conclusion of this list of papal crimes, you cannot convert anybody before you love him. Thank you. Here has a tape on that point. 
and I have proved scientifically thoroughly that Vatican II was not an ecumenical council. I cannot do that right now, it's past 10. I'll give you the simplicity proof, which usually is the best because it's the closest to God's simplicity. An ecumenical council is guaranteed the Holy Spirit and infallibility. In Vatican II, there are most definitely errors and contradictions. Bingo. Yes? People today say that the Catholic Church is against the death penalty. The Catholic Church has never been against the death penalty. Some people in the Catholic Church are against the death penalty. I'm not going to condemn them for it. If they hold this er erroneous opinion, let them hold it. Pius XII made absolutely sure that that is something to be reserved, however, to very grave cases. But Pius XII confirmed the Church doctrine that the Church will not be against capital punishment. And it's nonsense anyway. Uh, uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton said very rightly, if you do not punish heresy with death, what else? <laughs> Fear not the ones who can hurt your body, but the ones who can hurt your soul. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the idea of shooting heretics is an excellent one, but the problem is that through the lack of charity and through the lack of, pre of human precision, usually it hits the innocent. Yes? But heretics are the most dangerous people because they detract us from the faith. And sometimes very slightly so. They make us believe, oh wow, hey, great insight. But you know there's a problem, and I tell, this is one thing I, I not only tell you as the lay people, I tell this to my fellow priests. I fear nothing more than people who have learned a few tidbits of theology. I fear nothing more. With a few tidbits of theology, you can unhook the entire system of Catholic teaching. And uh, I fear the people who, uh, with zero charity, when reading theology, do not say, ah, oh, but, aha, aha, that will settle Father so-and-so, aha, that will settle Mr. So-and-so. Aha! Now I know why Father so-and-so is wrong. There is the Ah theologian. I'm grateful to God. I'm an Ah theologian. I'm always, I'm always amazed about the beauty of theology when it's really well done. And then there's the Aha theologian. The only reason why he studies theology is in order to, 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 to bash somebody. He doesn't study theology because he loves God and wants to know the truth. He studies theology in order to torpedo John Paul II, or torpedo the city of Arcantis, or torpedo Father Hess, or torpedo whomever comes to his mind. The purpose of theology is to enlighten us in our love and to bring us closer to God, not to destroy other people. No questions? Yes. What do you think of the situation of Father Wicked? The situation for the weekends, I know nothing about it. I shall not comment on things I don't know. All right. But I miss dear Father Wickens. He was a good friend of mine. And I know that good old, good old Paul up there now is a much more powerful in helping me than he did when he was alive. Yes? Um, what would be the relation between papal infallibility and uh, like the infallibility of the ordinary... Um, what would be the relation between papal infallibility and the extraordinary judgment and the uh, uh, yeah. and, and, and ordinary uh, ex and magisterium and the ordinary yeah. magisterium? Yeah. Very good question, thank you. Um, there is two infallible judgments, well actually three. If the Pope, in virtue of his uh, apostolic authority, teaches something to be held by all faithful all the time, uh, he has the assistance of the Holy Spirit. That is the, the papal infallible magisterium. It is ordinary to the Pope. He enjoys it in virtue of his office. The extraordinary magisterium is exclusively in an ecumenical council. Another reason why Vatican II was not a council, because everything in Vatican II is declared as ordinary judgment by the council. <laughs> they trap themselves. Uh, and the third way is the bishops in union with the Pope in their dioceses, however. The bishops do not enjoy uh, 
magisterium, ordinary magisterium when they are outside their diocese. They only enjoy ordinary magisterium inside the diocese, and that's infallible only if in union with the Pope and the other bishops. Vatican I defined as a dogma that if all bishops together hold something as divinely revealed, it is infallible. Some construe that that's, uh, that was the case in the decree on religious liberty, and that's why Paul VI ceased to be Pope. But that's nonsense, because the decree on religious liberty is null and void anyway, like any other document of Vatican II. It's just null and void. Vatican II was called in the wrong intention, the wrong matter, and the wrong form. Hmm. Yes? Do you believe that a state of necessity exists today? That well, I believe that a state of necessity exists for what? That would allow Catholics to disobey their bishop? That would allow Catholics to disobey their bishop? We don't need a, uh, 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 we don't need a situation of necessity for that. All that's needed is to see there's hardly a Catholic bishop around, so we can't follow him anyway. Pius IX said something very interesting on that. When uh, Bishop Gasser of Brixen, he uh, objected to the definition of, the, of infallibility in 1869. And he wrote to Pius IX and said, well, what about if a future pope was to, to preach heresy or to teach heresy? Pius IX just wrote back in a letter, which is collected in the Manzi collection, volume 55, something else. Uh, he says, well, you just don't listen to him. So we listen to Pius IX when he tells us, you just don't listen to a pope who teaches heresy. It's as simple as that. St. Thomas Aquinas says we cannot obey, uh, we cannot obey orders that come from, uh, that, that are not uh, legitimate in themselves. Can George Bush tell all officers in the United States Army to shoot their wives? They might be as happy as a lark about that <laughs> order, but they, they cannot do it. And he cannot command it. It's a null and void order. Oh, and excuse me, uh, state of necessity? Ah, we have Canon 144 and the new code of canon law, which says, in error of fact or law, or in positive doubt about fact or law, the church substitutes all internal and external jurisdiction. <laughs> I enjoy all jurisdiction I have in virtue of Canon 144. I don't need any emergency. In light of everything you've talked about, and, and, and I've talked about with other friends, is, is the confusion that exists, and you talk about the different errors. How in today, in the confusion there is, where how do you make your judgments from day to day? How do you figure out how to lead a good Catholic life, when especially yeah. the younger ones have? Well, how do I make my judgments from day day to day of what is the truth and what is not? How do I lead a Catholic life? Well, I buy old books. <laughs> <laughs> I read the old catechism and I live an old-fashioned life. That's, that's all I can recommend on this point. Keep the Ten Commandments, they haven't changed. Uh, on the uh, <coughs> baptism of desire, uh, <coughs> which has been the constant teaching of the church, although it has not been defined. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, controversy over that. I don't want to shock people about something that doesn't really affect our lives of souls. Mm -hmm. Next question. Good answer. Father, what is the status of the Pius X Society? What's this? What is uh, the status of the Pius Society in your opinion? The official status of the Society of St. Pius X, it is a legitimately established religious uh, group in the Catholic Church that has been illegitimately dissolved by Pope Paul VI with no due canonical process. Therefore, uh, they are in uh, official uh, good standing with the Church, whatever other problems may be. The legal status of the Society of St. Pius X is just the same as in any other religious group. Yes. Would you comment, uh, Father, on uh, uh, the new Mass in the light of Pope Primo? God permitted it to happen. That does not mean they're God's chosen people, but neither is the Pope, not necessarily. You think God wanted Innocent VIII? 
Alexander the Sixth and Leo the Tenth? No. But isn't isn't the Holy Spirit promised to the uh, cardinals when they elect the Pope? Yes, of course. Of course. But gratia presupponit natura. Grace presupposes nature. If a cardinal prostrates in the chapel and says, please let me know whom to elect, God will let him know. But usually they don't want to know. <laughs> you see, it's one of, the, uh, it's one of the, the, the greatest errors, and it pervades traditionalism today more than you would ever imagine to say that nature needs grace. Grace needs nature. You cannot confirm the village idiot. Neither can you ordain him. And the Jansenists, uh, in their inhumane system, would appoint people to positions that did not correspond to their national talents. That is not only uncharitable, it's most unwise. Uh, nature, nature has to be there in order to be strengthened by grace and sanctified by grace. But if nature is not there, grace won't do anything. If somebody by nature is a totally uncharitable person, he might confess and go to communion, but he's not, become, he's not going to become charitable over that. Did you say uh, the will is subservient to the heart? No, I didn't say the will is subservient to the heart. I said uh, the heart is greater than the will and the intellect. The will is the faculty of the human soul that tends towards the good. Voluntas tendi dat bonum. And the intellect is the faculty of the soul that tends towards the veil, the truth, the truth. Intellectus tendi dat veil. Swing qualities, the most, there is the most blessed. Swing.